Okay, time to start. I do not see Bridget or Jaron. All right, let us get going. Um, first of all, it was pointed out. It, it was pointed out that uh, the questions on the concept coach, most of them were fine, but every, I think I found three in the first five sections for chapter 27 that were put in the wrong section. I, I don't know how that happens. It's pretty clear, you know, Young's double slit is in this section, and you have the question three sections earlier. Um, I was, yeah, it was reported to me by a student, and I reported the questions. Hopefully they will fix that. Um, you had a question about that, Diksha? Yeah. Yeah, so for today, section one through three of chapter 27, and then, um, well, we will be covering more in lab tomorrow as well on this topic. So let's try to finish all of 27 for Wednesday. Question, Austin. Um, on Friday, you said we just have to finish section one today. You said the first I, section. Oh, is the first section the first? Yeah, I, I realized when I was responding to, to Sally this morning that section <laughs> was not a good choice of words. Yeah, what, what I intended to pass along was the first lecture grouping that's in the, yeah, and, and yeah, I realized this morning I could have said that in an <laughs> ambiguous way, and from what you just said, it sounded like you interpreted it in that way that I... I um so so that does that mean you did not do two and three? Yeah. More than okay. So I will just do, I will just count one because I'm pretty sure I did say the word that could easily be interpreted that it was just one. So I will just count one and then do the rest of chapter 27 for Wednesday. Okay. Let us get on with things. This here is a picture showing Young's double slit, which. I have 50-odd slides in this. Some of them I'm going to fly through, I expect, but I probably won't get to the last one. First, coherent light. Now, let us say that you have a textbook that you consider coherent. <laughs> what does that mean that you consider your textbook coherent? You can understand it. It's something that holds together. When we talk about incoherent and coherent light, it obviously can't be the same thing as a coherent textbook. But what it means to be coherent is to have a fixed phase relationship between light. Now, when I say a fixed phase relationship between light, I'm guessing for most people, that is sounding incoherent right there. So I think the next slide has a picture. Yes that makes it a little clearer, I think. <laughs> so this picture on the right is coherent. And what you have with the coherent light is all of the waves reach their peak at the same location at the same time. Now keep in mind this is a wave, so it's traveling. So at some later time the wave would have moved, but they're all working together in sequence. They all reach their peaks at one location. So if I'm standing here, when the light gets to me, all of the waves are at their peak. It passes and it gets to Chad, and when it gets to Chad, all of the waves are at their minimum. But they're staying all together. They don't have some that are at their peak at this location and others that are at the minimum at the same location at the same time. So that's what makes it coherent. The first picture, the one on the left, is incoherent. <clears throat> Missed a some, uh, syllable. Incoherent because the peaks are coming at different locations at the same time or at the same place at different times. So that would be incoherent. Does the, <laughs> Is that a coherent explanation of what coherence means? Now, the truth is, no source is perfectly coherent. And there is some coherence in all sources. If you have something like an incandescent light bulb, 
incandescent light bulb gives off light because you have a hot piece of metal. You have, we would generally say that's an incoherent light source, that the light is just not related. But from a single part of the filament, you will have some coherence for a short period of time. So it's not perfectly incoherent, it's not random, but it's not perfectly coherent, it's not everything is the same. And so in our talking in class, we're going to treat some things like they're perfectly coherent, but we should understand nothing's perfectly coherent. When we talk about lasers, lasers are a coherent light source, which means that their phases would just go like this forever if it was true. But in fact, they only go like this for a few seconds maybe. And then it switches. But if you think about the light, it travels, you know, 300 million meters in a second. So if it goes for a few seconds being coherent, that's a very large distance the light traveled that was coherent. And so we talk about wave trains, how long the distance for it to be coherent. And, you know, if you have a wave train that's over a kilometer long, well, for an experiment you're doing in the lab, it's, you might as well treat it as perfectly coherent. Why would it change? Uh, well, obviously I don't have time to talk about lasers, so let's do it. <laughs> to make a laser, a typical laser such as the one I'm showing there, you have what we call a cavity. And inside of that cavity you have a 100% reflecting mirror on one side and let's say a 98% reflecting mirror on the other. Reef, nope, that's an L. Well, back the bus up. That's the T. Inside of this cavity, you have your lasing medium. And that medium is some material that has just the right energy levels. We'll talk about the energy level situation later. But those energy levels are metastable. That means that you get an electron in this metastable energy level, and it'll just sit there for a while before it falls back down. It doesn't just instantly fall back down. And with that, we can have stimulated emission. What stimulated emission means is, I have a little molecule here that has the electron in the excited state. Now, if you want to be really accurate, it's the electron in the excited state, the molecule's in an excited state. Um, but it's in an excited state, and then light comes by. And so I have light comes by from something else that's already produced exactly the same wavelength of light. Well, when it comes by, we've learned that light goes slower in a medium than it does in vacuum because there's that interaction. It's essentially absorbed and re-emitted. Well, in this case, when it's absorbed, it causes the molecule to de-excite and give off its own energy and light. And so it'll oscillate with it. It's kind of like you have two swings next to each other. One is swinging, it makes the other one swing with it. And so what happens is this light comes out unchanged, but you have light from that little excited molecule that comes out with it exactly in phase. And then that light goes back and forth through here, and so it sweeps up, it amplifies as it goes, because you have one, now you have two, you hit another molecule, now you have three, another molecule, now you have four. And it sweeps through and adds up all of this energy that's all in phase because of how it was produced. That's why. And why do the wave trains not last forever? Because this started with one molecule randomly falling down and giving off a single, float, a single wave. And then that one caused a whole bunch to cascade with it. As soon as another one falls down, then you'll have another wave train start. All right. So I already said this. Um, <laughs> yeah, just move forward. <sighs> Phase difference between two beams can arise because you have different lengths from a coherent source. So most of what I'm going to do today, I'm going to start by saying I have a coherent light source. 
I start with the light all in phase. But if I have different path lengths going from point A to point B, then it's starting in phase, but it won't be in phase when it gets to the final place because you had different lengths. And so you went one, if one path length was three wavelengths and one path, path length was four and a half wavelengths, then they're no longer perfectly in phase. Now, if you shift by one wavelength, if I have two waves, I start like this, and then I take one of these, and I have to freehand this. I take one of these and I shift it by one wavelength. Are they still in, are they still in phase? Are they still coherent, if you will? Yeah. yeah. So if I shift it by one wavelength, it stays in phase. So integer shifts don't make any difference. But if I shifted it by something other than an integer, it would make a difference. And so here I have two that are in phase, or I could have them out of phase. And I hope that my next slide is showing, oh, I shifted my slides around in the 10 minutes before my last class, and my next slide that showed the next step is now about like nine steps later. Um, so let me just finish this by saying we can have constructive interference. We've studied constructive and destructive, I think, when we talked about sound. But if they are in phase, then we have constructive interference. If they are shifted so that they are 180 degrees out of phase, then we have destructive interference. So if I have one like... <laughs> That's not a perfect sine wave. So here they're in phase, and now if I shift the lower one <clears throat> by 180 degrees or a half wavelength, now they're out of phase and we have destructive interference. And later on in the lecture, I will take you through some calculations for constructive versus destructive interference. But destructive, you add the two waves together, add their displacements, and if they add to zero, it was perfectly destructive. Remember when we talked about sound waves and waves on a string, and we talked about standing waves, nodes, and anti-nodes? The nodes were places where we always had destructive interference. The anti-nodes are places where we had constructive interference. Okay. Start off with the Michelson interferometer. Uh, not that many Americans in physics, so we like to point out that Michelson was an American. Um, Michelson invented an interferometer that allows you to, to make measurements about indices of refraction or changes in path length. Now, I will remind me to talk about LIGO when I finish talking about this, because LIGO is a super huge Michelson interferometer. So what you have is a light source. It needs to be a coherent light source, so you use a laser. And then you have a beam splitter here. This is a 50% reflecting mirror. Why 50% reflecting? Because then half of your wave goes straight through, and half of it's reflected. And then the wave that goes straight through hits a mirror, comes back, and 50% of that then is reflected to the screen. The light that was reflected comes over, hits this mirror, comes back, and 50% goes to the screen. Now we have light paths that are slightly different because we have distance 2 here and distance 1 here. The light path for beam 1 is the distance from the source to the mirror to the screen plus 2 times d1 because it went down and back. The light that went to this mirror is this distance plus 2 times d2. So the distances are different, which means it can be in phase or out of phase. Now, if you look at the screen, what do you see on the screen? It's like ripples. What you're seeing is circular dark and bright fringes is what we call them. You have constructive interference in the center, and so it's bright. 
Constructive interference means that they were in phase. Then you have a dark fringe, that's where they're perfectly out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase. Why is that occurring in these circles? Because the beam is not perfectly collimated. It spreads a little. And so the light that hits, for instance, up here, traveled a different distance than the light that hit the center. And that fraction is going to depend on D1 and D2. And so you have those circular fringes. Now, what's the usefulness of this? Well, let's take the LIGO experiment. Everybody remember hearing LIGO in the news a month ago? <laughs> no. No, physics wasn't the top of my list of in LIGO. It's, I believe, laser interferometry gravitational observatory. It's something like that. Each word might be a variation on what I wrote. But they're using an interferometer. They're using exactly a Michelson interferometer to try to measure gravitational waves. How so? They have an interferometer that's like more than a kilometer long for its legs. Very large distance. And then they're looking at the pattern and looking for changes in the interference pattern. Now, what would cause a change in that interference pattern? You have to have one leg change compared to the other leg. If they both change length by the same amount, it wouldn't show anything. But if they, one change is more than the other one, then you would have something show up. So, for instance, when an earthquake comes, which I think might be what you were saying with this, I don't know. If an earthquake comes, you would have the path lengths change, and you would see that with the interferometer. Or a gravitational wave, in theory, and I say in theory because until about a month ago, that's all it was. In theory, the gravitational wave will cause space to be compressed a little and cause a change in the length. And so they look for this, and they look for a signal. Now, if you just have one observatory, you're just kind of out of luck. Look, we saw something, and we can't identify if it was something important or not. So they have two of these interferometers, and they try to match if there was a correlation between what happened with one and what happened with the other. And that's what they found a, couple, a month or two ago. And so it was the first ever believed observation of gravitational waves which had been predicted by physicists long ago and are one of those last final things, according to current theories, to be discovered. We, we've already, as of a couple years ago, discovered the other last final thing, the Higgs boson. So, you know, it's, it's exciting times. We're finishing up. We're almost like they were in 1900 when they thought physics was all done, that they figured everything out. We're, we're back to that stage. And I'm not getting cocky. I'm pretty sure that we'll find that no... We still have a lot that we're missing. So they use this interferometer idea. So um, th this is actually a problem here. Suppose a transparent vessel with a cavity 30 centimeters long is placed in one of the arms of the Michelson interferometer. It initially contains air at 0 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. So 0 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, that tells you what the index of refraction is, right? You can look it up 1.00 whatever. And then you use a wave, a laser with 633 nanometer light. And the mirrors are arranged so you have a bright spot at the center, like is shown in this picture. And then you pump all the air out of the little chamber. And you measured 274 times it switched from being bright at the center to dark at the center back to bright. How could that possibly be useful to you? <laughs> you what? Okay, you can tell that it changed 
phase 274 times. So that means the light path shifted by 274 wavelengths. Now, how did the light path change by 274 wavelengths? What happens to the wavelength of a material when you change the index of refraction? Okay, the wavelength changes. What happens to the frequency when you change the index of refraction? It stays the same. The frequency has to stay the same. It goes back to what we said when we talked about waves on a string. If I have two strings that are tied together, the frequency on both sides of the knot has to be the same, or the knot would have to break apart. So the frequency has to stay the same when light goes from one material to another. But the wavelength doesn't. So we know the relationship between frequency and wavelength, that is, frequency multiplied by wavelength is equal to the speed of light. And so wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by frequency. The frequency is a constant. And so we can say, that's not a wavelength. <clears throat> wavelength 1 divided by the wavelength in vacuum is equal to speed 1 over frequency divided by the speed of light in vacuum over frequency. Cancel the Fs. Well, by definition, that's 1 over index refraction 1. Right, index refraction is defined as N is equal to C over V. And so this gives me the wavelength in some material is equal to the wavelength in vacuum divided by the index refraction of that material. So we know the wavelength shifts when we change index of refraction. And we know that we went from, we had 274 274 fringes, so we had 200, I'm making sure that's right. So we had 20, 274 wavelengths, different path length when there was air in there to when there's vacuum in there. Now, if we look at our little chamber, it was 30.0 centimeters long, I believe. And the light had to go through it how many times? Twice. Once going, once coming back, because remember, it goes out to the mirror and back. So the light had to go through it twice, and the number of wavelengths, number of wavelengths is equal to the length divided by the wavelength. So number in vacuum, uh, actually, it's the other way around, the number in air minus the number in vacuum is equal to the length over the wavelength in air minus the length over the wavelength in vacuum. So we know this number right here, 274 equals 30.0 centimeters. And then we have, well, Let's just go back to wavelength 1 is wavelength in vacuum over N1. I ran out of space. Uh. If you take this and solve it for 1 over wavelength, it's going to be and 1 over lambda 0, minus 1 over lambda 0. So now we can just put in the numbers. N1 minus 1 is equal to 274 times the wavelength, which was 633 nanometers, <laughs> divided by the length 30.0. Actually, I forgot. It's doubled, right? So the length is 2 times this, 60.0 centimeters. And then you just have to do the math, and it tells you what the index refraction was in, in the air. 
So since I've done all of this work and spent a lot of time on it, what do I get for that calculation? Now remember, 633 nanometers, that's 6.33 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by 60 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay, so coming up here because I ran out of space, N1 is equal to 1.00 what? 0, 0, 0, 0028907. Okay, we only had three significant digits here, and notice that three significant digits was in N1 minus 1. So these are the three significant digits, and so there's our index refraction in air based on that experiment. And then we could go and check and see how that compares to the actual index refraction in air. Um, but that's, that's a way it can be used. So that interferometer has useful applications for determining path lengths and the changes in path lengths. Now here is a thin film picture. You guys have seen stuff like this. You have water with soap in it. You dip your little thing in it. You bring it out and you see the pretty colors. Why does it make pretty colors? I don't know, but it must have to do with physics. Different colors correspond to different wavelengths. So that definitely is in play here. It actually is not a strong function of the speed. Um, we'll, we'll go through it. I want to point out a few other things. Why do you have soap in that water? <clears throat> it's what? Like the bubbles Yeah. Right, I mean, when we were kids, that, right, we didn't have enough money to go buy the little soap stuff. We mixed the little dish soap with water. <laughs> it, it's, it seems counterintuitive until you know the answer. What is the purpose of soap in general? It, it's a surfactant. It lowers the surface tension of the water, which means that it makes the water membrane not as strong. The water is more likely to break when you have soap in it than when you didn't. And then you're like, why in the world do I want to make my water more likely to break? It's because the soap is polar. And because it's polar, it forms a thin layer on the top of the water. And so it keeps the water from being able to evaporate. And so you're making the water, a little, the water film a little weaker, but it's going to stick around longer. And so that's why you use it, to keep it from evaporating. OK, so we have this. And you see it's dark up here at the top. Dark up there. What kind of interference do I have if it's dark? So that was destructive interference for all colors. And then we have pretty colors. So in here we had some colors had destructive. Some colors. Others constructive. So we want to figure out why that's occurring. Right? We wouldn't be in physics class if we weren't trying to figure out why that, well, we wouldn't be. Physics <laughs> class is about trying to figure out why things happen. So here's a picture to illustrate what happens with a thin film. So I have on this side air. On this side air. That's not how you spell air. And in between, I have a film, which might be water. And so I have light that comes and hits the first side. And two things can happen when light hits a surface. 
it can be transmitted or it can be reflected. So it's transparent, not absorbed. Okay, this third thing can be absorbed. So we have a reflected ray, reflected rays one, two, and three. Now remember I said typically you're going to have somewhere around 90% or more transmitted, around 10% reflected. I might have said 5 and 95. It depends on the materials. So we're going to have this here is maybe 10% of the original beam. And this is 90% of the original beam. Then it hits the next side. And how much comes out? About 90%. So 90% of 90% is about 81% of the original beam is right there. And this is about 10% reflected, 10% of 9% is 9%, or 90% is 9%. And then transmitted, 9 times 90 is 8.1% comes out here. Let me put it out here. And, of course, I have the remaining 0.9% coming back, hits here, and I have 0.9 times 90 is 0.81% here, and so on. Now, you look at these 81% and 0.81%, the intensities are very different. And so you're probably not going to see too much in that transmitted compared to what you'd see over here with 10% and 8.1%. The reflections are pretty similar. So you're going to see a lot more effect over here on the reflected side. Now, in terms of interference, if I'm going to have constructive interference, I need the phase difference. So I will put here change in phase is equal to an integer number of 2 pi radians or an integer number of 360 degrees. That is, they're in phase and going to be constructive if they're 360 degrees out of phase, 720 degrees out of phase, or something like that. There's another way of writing this, and that is the optical path length. If the optical path length is an integer multiple of wavelengths. If the optical path length is one wavelength difference, that means they come out so they're one wavelength shifted, they're going to be right on top of each other and constructive again. So either one of those would give me constructive interference. Destructive interference occurs halfway in between. So destructive Halfway in between, I just put m plus 1 half times 2 pi radians. Or the path length difference is a half integer number of wavelengths. Those are the conditions for constructive or destructive interference. So if I look at these light rays, I can determine, OK, Let's compare rays 1 and 2 and see if those are constructive or destructive. Now, I'm going to do a calculation. I'm going to sit down. I'm tired of standing. I'm going to do a calculation here that's going to turn out to be wrong because I'm going to skip one important factor. The calculations will all be right. I'm just going to skip one factor that we'll have a clicker question on and then add it in. So we start with light that reflects here. On reflection, I'm going to say, okay, I was perfectly in phase because I had just one beam. When it reflected, I still have that one beam. I'm just going to say, okay, there is no difference in the path length, right? And so I'm going to say the phase difference for this one is zero because it didn't have to do anything. It just got reflected. By the way, that's where I have the omission. <laughs> Now coming through, this light had to travel this distance. In my picture, this distance here is by definition going to be larger than the thickness T because it's not going straight across, it's going at an angle. But for physics purposes, 
we're going to be treating thin films. If the film is thin, we're also going to say, let's make the light so it's coming basically straight down on it, right? As long as we're making approximations. And so we're going to say that this light was actually going straight down and straight back. So it went a distance thickness in and then a distance thickness back. So I had a difference in length of two times the thickness, right? I put two times the thickness, but that's not an angle. That's a length. How much angle did I have changed then? <clears throat> <laughs> no, because I know that I have some material here with index refraction N film, then I know the wavelength in here is the wavelength in vacuum divided by N film. And if I take the thickness divided by the wavelength, that'll tell me how many wavelengths it was. So I'm going to take this and divide it by the wavelength. And then I have to multiply by, of course, 2 pi radians to get it into units of angle. So using this definition here, I can expand that a little more. And that's my shit, my angle for the second one. So that's the angle difference between what I had for my light coming in and what I have coming out in ray one and coming out in ray two. Now let's check this to see if it's constructive or destructive. So the true change in phase is going to be the change for ray two minus the change for ray one, which is two times the thickness over the wavelength in air times the index refraction of the film multiplied by two pi radians minus zero. And then we say, ha, huh, is it constructive or destructive? Well, if constructive, Delta phi is m times 2 pi. And since I just calculate delta phi, so this relationship will tell me if it's constructive. So I can look at this and solve for the thickness that will give me constructive interference for a given wavelength. So let's solve it for t. Notice I have 2 pi on both sides, so I can cancel those out now. M lambda 0 over 2. So there's the thicknesses that will give me constructive interference for a given wavelength lambda zero. Now I told you there's one mistake in this. I wanted to make sure I point that out at the beginning so we don't get to the end and then, you know, I say, oh, my bad. So let's look at what that one mistake was. I should have a clicker question here. Yes. What happens to transverse wave when it's transmitting? <laughs> from a slower to a faster wave speed.
I, yeah, yeah. Th this is you can answer multiple things and then press enter. Although don't answer A and something else because that wouldn't be logical. Um, no, I, I believe you put in multiple answers as many as you think are correct and then hit enter. Sally, you have an answer. You still thinking about Anne? Okay, now everyone's answered. We have nobody that said nothing, 12 people that said the transmitted wavelength is shorter. Six that said the transmitted wavelength is longer. Nine that said the transmitted frequency increases. Two that said the transmitted frequency decreases. And six that said the transmitted wave has a phase inversion of 180 degrees. Okay, good that we asked this question. This is stuff from first semester, so it's been a long time since you covered it. So what happens? First... What did I say about the frequency? I did talk about that today in the wavelength. It doesn't change. The frequency cannot change, OK? Until we get to the particle nature of light, that's a rule. For a wave, the frequency cannot change. So neither of these could be correct, because the frequency has to stay the same. But the frequency stays the same, and we go from slower to faster, so it speeds up. What happens to the wavelength? If it's going faster, it'll take the same amount of time for one cycle, but it goes a bigger distance. So it goes longer. And then we have the phase. On transmission, the phase never shifts. So on transmission, the phase never shifts. So there was only one correct answer here. But there's a second follow-up question. <laughs> so now it's reflected. The last one was transmitted. Yeah, string, because that's what we studied when we studied this the first time. I have answers from everyone but Reagan, Zach, Chad, and Tori. <laughs> now it's just Chad. Okay. We had five, six, four, one, one, twelve. <laughs> okay, so let's start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. The reflected wave. When we go from, it, it was traveling down a string with a, yeah, traveling on the slower string and hits a string that has a faster speed. If it hits a string with a faster speed, that was the same as if it was tied to nothing. And when it was tied to nothing, the reflection had no phase shift. If it hit a string that was a slower speed, that's the same as tried, tied to a fixed 
object and it has a phase shift of 180 degrees. So because it hits something with a faster speed, Okay, so there's only the shift if it hits something with a slower speed. Hit something faster speed, no shift. That's actually the key. That's the part that I skipped in my derivation. Okay, frequency. We're staying on the same string, but even if we weren't, what do we say about the frequency? Can't it can't change. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Because we're on the same string, the speed isn't changing, right, because it's reflected. If it was transmitted, we would have a change in speed. But since it's the same speed and the same frequency, what does it tell you about the wavelength? Same wavelength. So the correct answer here was nothing. Now, why did I go through these two questions? This is stuff you learned first semester. I understand that it's rusty. It's not something you, well, actually, it was in the concept coach preparation and stuff. But there was, I think, only one question that had to do with this. It's really vital when you're talking about thin film interference to pay attention to where you have a phase shift on reflection and where you don't. So anytime you have a reflection off of something with a higher index of refraction, that's a slower speed, you're going to have a phase shift of 180 degrees, or pi radians. So the rule is, if N, N1, and reflecting off of N2, and delta phi reflection equals pi radians, or 180 degrees if N2 is bigger than N1 equals zero if that's supposed to be a N1 there. Zero if N2 is smaller than N1. That's a very important rule. So now let's go back to our derivation and see how that applies. So we look here, that first reflection, if we're going from air to the film, is N2 bigger than or smaller than N1? It's bigger. If N2 is bigger, what does that tell you about the phase shift? 180 degrees or pi radians. So this zero was wrong. I told you it was incorrect at the time just to make sure that we don't have the shock of coming back. This here is because of reflection. Now we come and we reflect off the back side. Off the back side, we're going from film to air. So was the second one a bigger or smaller index refraction? Smaller. What does that tell us about the reflection? No shift. So now that we have that straight, now we come down, and when we do our difference, we had to put the pi there instead of the zero because we had a pi radian shift. And so you move that across here. And you have... And so now we can solve this for, um, wait, yeah, I'm sorry. I put, I put it the wrong way. And now I'm doing the wrong thing, too. It should have been, it should have been pi that I factored out. 2m plus 1, yes. Thank you for correcting me. I was thinking, that's not going to come out right. 
And so then I can cancel just the pi's, and I come out with the equation that says the thickness that's going to be constructive is going to be 2m plus 1. And so that's the correct equation. Now, for everybody's motion, yes, it is time to end class. <laughs> this was the part of the lecture I added in the last 10 minutes before my last one that I forgot to cover. So we'll cover the rest of it at the beginning of lab. Lab tomorrow, you just have two tests. You don't have a hypothesis. You just have the two tests. <laughs>